Chapter 9, Sequences and Series, starting with Section 1, again, Sequences and Series. So, kind of getting into a mindset of looking at a function that deals with the terms, from the first term to the second term to the third term. In the past, we've looked at functions as a specific the x value, f of negative 5, f of 2. Sequences and series are functions but you look at the terms from one to the next and they all kind of link together. How we talk about them, you know, f of 1, you know, you've seen that before in the sequence, sequence or series, f of 1 gives you your first term, f sub 1. Now, the minute I said that, I thought, ah, first term. In this case, starting with f of 1, a sub 1 is the first term. If your sequence starts with 3, a sub 3 is then your first term. If your sequence starts with 0, a sub Zero is your first term. But f of 2, a sub 2, f of 3, a sub 3, f of 4, a sub 4, and so on until the sequence is done for a finite sequence. An infinite sequence or series goes infinitely forever. If it's finite, you go to the nth term. to give you a sub n. <coughs> a sequence, an infinite sequence, is a function whose domain is the set of positive integers. Those positive integers give you a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, a sub n, and so on. Those are all terms of the sequence. So the inputs are integers, they give you your terms. So you won't see a sub one half, a sub seven thirds. You'll always see sub a positive integer. So write the first term, four terms of the sequences given by. We have a sub n equals three n minus two. So kind of going through this, very initial idea. You want to find a sub 1. You replace the a sub n, the n with a 1, over on the right side. The 3n, n also replaced with a 1. So 3 times 1 minus 2. And I really don't want the parentheses around the 3. So. And of course you get 4. a sub 2, replace the sub n with a 2. You want to replace the other n with also a 2. And that's 4. Numbers are hard. 3 times 1 minus 2 is 1. a sub 3 Replace both ends with the 3, and you get 7. a sub 4, replace both ends with the 4, and you get 11. <coughs> now here's the thing. <coughs> we were given a formula, 3n minus 2. If you're only given the first couple of terms, that is not enough to say two sequences are the same. See, for example, we have one half as our first term, one fourth as the second term, one eighth as the third term, they're all the same. You may think, hey, those are the same sequence. By the fourth term, you see the terms are a little different. And the formulas, for the sequences are very different. 
So you can't make assumptions based off of a handful of terms. You have to look at the sequence as a whole, and the formula for the sequence is the best way to make that kind of call. There are also recursive sequences, which require knowing previous terms in order to get the next term. So for example, where do those go? Here we are. Still want to make sure I write this down correctly. So to get the next term you want, you need the previous term or in the case of the Fibonacci sequence, the second previous term. So n minus 2, the term be 2 before n. So if n is 7, your seventh term, you need to start with the term 2 behind that, so the fifth term. In the Fibonacci sequence, as you add the term 2 ago, to the term just before. So n minus 1. So in case you've seen the Fibonacci sequence before or not, let's look at how that works. So your first term, your second term, your third term, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. And then, of course, you could go forever with it. Now, the Fibonacci sequence starts with the first uh, two or three terms. Depends on who you ask. But the first term is zero. The second term is one. Let's drop to the first two, okay? So to get the third, you add the previous two. So to get the third, you add the one before, which is one. The one before that was zero. Zero plus one is one. To get the fourth term, take the term before the first term, so the third. Take the term before the third, the second. Add them together. 1 plus 1 is 2. To get the fifth term, take the 1 before it and the 1 2 before it. Add them together, get 3. To get the sixth term, take the term before it and the term before that. 2 plus 3, add them together, 5. And you keep going. 13 and 21, 34, and if you wanted to keep going on, you could. So recursive sequences mean you got to take terms before the one you want, do whatever the sequence says to them, and then you get the term you want, the nth term. Factorial notation, so the exclamation mark. That means n factorial is you take every integer before that factorial and the integer it is, multiply them together. So if you want n factorial, you need n, n minus 1, the number before it, all the way down to 1. You multiply them all together. And then there's a special case of 0 factorial. 0 factorial is defined as equal to 1. <coughs> so if we have to write the first five terms of the sequence given by a sub n equals to the n over n factorial, then the thing begin with n equals 0. So if we were to do that, 
a sub zero, we replace the sub n with zero, we replace the other ends with zero also. <coughs> 2 to the 0 is 1, 0 factorial is 1, 1 over 1 is 1. <coughs> A sub 1, so 2 to the first over 1 factorial, 2 to the first is 2, 1 factorial is 1, you get 2. A sub 2, so the sub 2. 2 to the second over 2 factorial. 2 to the second is 4. 2 factorial, 2 times 1 is 2. So again, we get 2. A sub 3. 2 to the third over 3 factorial. 2 to the third is 8. 3 factorial, 3 times 2 times 1 is 6. Get 4 thirds. 8 to the 4th. 2 to the 4th power over 4 factorial. 2 to the 4th is 16. 4 factorial, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 is 24. That gives us to uh, divide both by 8, and you get 2 thirds. It's kind of how you use factorials. Summation notation. Let's say we want to take all the terms of a sequence and add them up from the first term. Now, the first term is your lower bound. Here, your first term is 1. Here, your first term is 3, plugging 3 in. Here, your first term is 0, plugging 0 in. So your first term will not always match your lower bound. Your lower bound tells you what your first term will be. The first term is not always a sub 1. But to do a summation, you want all of your terms, in this case, example A, from the first to the fifth. And then summation, the Greek sigma, adding all those terms up. So A sub 1 is 3 times 1, which is 3. A sub 2. 3 times 2, which is 6. A sub 3 is 9. A sub 4 is 12. A sub 5 is 15. And then we want to add all of those together. 3, 6, 9, 12 and 15. So 15 and 12, 27, 9, 36, 63, another 9, 36 and 9. I believe that's 45. Let's check. Make sure. Good, I can do math. I can do basic math. Okay. Now, series are where. A summation extends the upper bound to infinity. Now, of course, you won't always get an answer because if your terms infinitely get bigger and bigger, your sum infinitely gets bigger and bigger. So infinite summations don't always work. You just kind of put that out there, okay? Although sometimes they do. For example, this right here, 3 over 10i, 10 to the power of i, from 1 to infinity. So let's look at the third partial sum. A partial, we're taking part of the infinite summation. a sub 1 
is 3 over 10 to the first or 10 as the decimal 0 0.3 a sub 2 3 over 10 squared that's 100 which is 0 0.03 a sub 3 would be 3 over 10 cubed, 3 over 1,000, that would be 0 0.003. So adding all those together, 0 0.333. And you see how each term adds another 3 to the end of the decimal. So the infinite sum just follow that pattern. You're going to keep adding a 3 to the end of the decimal, so point three, 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 and infinitely many 3's. So repeating, you can simplify that down to one third. So especially at the beginning, we want to try and look at patterns for how all of these sequences work and from those patterns, if you recognize something that is consistent, you can make a generalized formula for it.